One of the words that destroys everything is called neglect. And I found this out. A week of neglect could cost you a year of repair. Here's the list of attitude diseases. Number one is indifference. The shrug of the shoulder. The guy is not even concerned. He's just drifting. Well, to be any kind of winner, you've got to get worked up. There's one problem with drift. You cannot drift to the top of the mountain. A life full of adventure is a life full of many decisions. The ones that turn out to be wrong give you better experience to make better decisions. So, don't see how many decisions you can get out of, see how many decisions you can get into. That's where the adventure is. So shake off this disease. Indecision. The next one is doubt. And one of the worst is self-doubt. The guy doubts himself. Doubts if it'll last that long for him. Doubts if he can do that well. Doubts if he can make that much. Doubts if he can accomplish all that. So here's the key. Earn this coin over and become a believer. And there are many things to believe in. One of the majors is yourself. Now, if those three don't get you, this one will. Worry. That's a devastating disease. Worry causes health problems, social problems, personal problems, family problems. I used to have it bad. I used to be known as a super warrior. Not a super warrior, no. A super warrior. My advice to you is do what I finally did on worry. Give it up. I'm not saying it's easy. It took me almost one year to kick the worry habit. And it was not an easy year. But I learned how to do it. And you can too. Here's the next attitude disease. Over caution. Now you can also be too reckless. But you can also be too cautious. And my caution was always at risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. And I'll tell you what changed my whole life. When I finally discovered, it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. The Englishman says, Well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go, right? That's what it's for, to give it a go. Somebody says, Yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine. Then huddle in a corner, we'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day, and we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you, care for you, care for you. The guy said, Yeah, I'd live to be 100, but what a way to live, right? What a way to live, safe and secure. And see, it's not important how long you live, what's important is how you live. Here's the next attitude disease, pessimism. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. What's important is how we feel about life that will decide how life feels about us. If we think we're going to fail, we might not even try. We are more likely to succeed in life if we have a positive I can do it attitude than if we have a negative I can't attitude. So, attitude is the magic word that can change our lives. It's up to us to have a good attitude about life and all the problems it brings. Before we talk about our attitude toward the world, it's important to discuss our attitude toward ourselves. We tend to minimize our own abilities and the goals we can achieve. We also tend to believe that others can accomplish things in our field that we cannot. As a result of this defensive, doubtful attitude toward ourselves, many people live narrow, darkened, and frustrated lives. However, those who stay young all their lives not only welcome change but see it for what it really is. A new opportunity, a chance for further fulfillment. Attitude is a reflection of a person's will, and it's incalculably powerful. It can bring about marvelous results for us, but we need to train it patiently day by day. Successful people, who constitute the top 5% of individuals, who go from one success to another, have a particular kind of attitude towards themselves and life that sets them apart from the rest. They possess a strong belief in their ability to accomplish what they set out to do, and they approach life with a healthy and positive attitude. Successful people possess an attitude towards themselves that is characterized by healthy self-esteem, confidence, and a positive outlook. They also have a healthy attitude towards failure, seeing it as an opportunity to learn and improve, rather than a setback. One of the remarkable things about successful people is that they come to be called successful, outstanding, brilliant, lucky, and a host of other accolades, even though they are not necessarily more intelligent or outstanding than the people around them. They're unwavering in their ability to succeed. Healthy self-esteem and a positive outlook set them apart from the rest. 
They see failure as an opportunity to learn and grow, and obstacles as opportunities to overcome. By developing the right attitude towards themselves in life, anyone can achieve success and live their best life. The importance of attitude cannot be overstated. People who are successful, regardless of their field or background, all have one thing in common. The right attitude. They expect more good out of life than bad, and they expect to succeed more than they fail. This mindset makes them resilient to failures and setbacks. The world we live in is impersonal and does not care whether we change or not. However, adopting a good healthy attitude towards life can make a huge difference in our lives. By adopting a successful attitude, we can achieve our goals and lead a fulfilling life. It doesn't matter how good your attitude has been in the past, there's always room for improvement. Small refinements upon something already good can make it great. So here's the test for the next 30 days. Act towards the world. Everything and everyone with whom you come in contact with the attitude that represents the kind of results you want to achieve. For instance, if you want to be more successful in what you're doing, act as though you are already in possession of the success you seek. If you want others to treat you with admiration and respect, treat others with admiration and respect first. When you treat others with respect and kindness, you are likely to receive the same treatment in return. This can lead to better relationships, improved communication, and ultimately, more happiness and success in your personal and professional life. Success is not just about personal achievement, but also about the relationships and connections they make along the way. When you have a positive attitude, people are naturally drawn to you. So for the next 30 days, make a conscious effort to treat others with the same kindness and respect that you want to be treated with. The key here is to approach each interaction with a positive mindset. Instead of focusing on what you can get out of the interaction, Focus on what you can give. Remember, the good attitude is not something you have to be born with. It's something that can be developed through conscious effort and practice. You would recognize that when a person consistently acts with a positive and productive attitude, they have already placed themselves on the path to success. You would know that this kind of attitude places a person in the top 5% of individuals in any country. Similarly, before building a structure, the excavation and foundation must be laid. In order to achieve the kind of life a person wants, they must become the kind of individual they wish to be. They must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct themselves in all their affairs as the person they wish to become. Once a person becomes that individual, the things that person would have and do will naturally come to them almost immediately. Irritations that used to frustrate and annoy will disappear. When someone gives them a hard time, they will stay on track and not let the negative behavior affect them. By acting with a positive attitude, a person separates themselves from this negative group and begins to attract positive experiences and people into their lives. It's a universal truth that every human being has a deep-seated desire to feel valued and important. This need is not restricted to any particular gender or age group, but rather it is a fundamental need that every individual has. From the time we are born, we crave attention and affection from those around us, and this need only intensifies as we grow older. On the other hand, when someone treats you with respect and kindness, acknowledges your efforts and makes you feel important, it feels great, doesn't it? This is a feeling that we all crave and seek in our personal and professional relationships. Can you guess what's the most important quality to predict success and happiness in life? It's optimism. What they found was that successful people had really high levels of optimism. They were really optimistic. They were positive most of the time. Does that mean they didn't have problems? Oh, they had far more problems than the average person because they tried more things. They found that optimists had two great qualities which led to their success. Number one was they tried more things because they had an unrealistic expectation that they would be successful. They just kind of believed they would be successful. Yeah, they believed that if they just kept on, they would be successful. So they tried more things. Now the second quality they had is they persisted more because they had an unrealistic expectation that if they just persisted more, they'd succeed. What optimists have is what I call orientations. And the first orientation that optimists had is future orientation. They think about where they're going most of the time, they think about the possibilities of the future, and they idealize. There are four areas where optimists idealize. Great health, loving relationships, meaningful work, and financial independence. Now the second part, the second orientation that successful people have is goal orientation.
Goal orientation means that they have very clear, written goals that they work on every single day. And the third orientation is excellence orientation. In order to achieve something you have never achieved before, you have to be good at something you've never been good at before. You have to develop skills you've never had before. The only way we're going to get to the top 10% is by becoming very good at what we do. There are no shortcuts, we just have to get down and work it out. And the fourth orientation is growth orientation. Growth orientation is the key to the future and the key to your success as well. There are three things. Read on a regular basis, attend all the seminars that you can, and have a mentor. So there you have it. Attitude is everything. With the right attitude, you can achieve anything you set your mind to. So go out there, be optimistic, set clear goals, drive for excellence, and never stop growing. People who are destined for great success in the future are willing to make sacrifices in the present to ensure that future. By sacrifices, we mean they are willing to put in long hours, get up earlier, work harder, and stay later. They're willing to invest and save their money, even though they don't have a lot, knowing that with compound interest, it will grow over time. They're willing to spend an enormous amount of time investing in their children, knowing that this investment in their children, in time, love, affection, and support, will pay off for decades and generations, even into the lives of their children and grandchildren. So, sacrifice is the critical word, and sacrifice means that you have the ability to discipline yourself, to delay gratification in the short term, so that you can enjoy far greater rewards in the long term. We say that self-discipline is self-control. It's self-mastery. Now the payoff for practicing self-discipline is immediate. People might think, well geez, you know, I get these rewards weighed down in the future. No, no, there is an immediate reward. There's a wonderful line in spiritual development that said, you are not punished for your sins but by them. In other words, there are things that you do that are harmful to you, that cause immediate detriment, but you're also rewarded for the good things that you do, and you're rewarded immediately. So what we know is, when you practice self-discipline, you actually like and respect yourself more. And you know, and I know, that how you feel about yourself on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Do you feel that you're a good person? Do you feel that you're a likable person? A successful person? The more you like yourself and respect yourself and value yourself on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, the better is your attitude, the better is your reaction to other people. You just feel happy inside. And wonderfully enough, when you practice self-discipline, when you exert yourself to do what you know you should do, even though there's endless temptations to do something fun and easy, when you discipline yourself to do it, your self-esteem goes up. You actually like yourself more. Your self-image improves. You actually see yourself as a better person. And of course, as you know, your self-image determines your performance. The person you see in your mind will be the person that you will be on the outside. And the wonderful thing is, when you practice self-discipline, especially in exercise, for example, but even in hard work, your brain releases endorphins. Endorphins are called nature's happy drug. And it actually makes you happy to practice self-discipline, to take control of yourself, and make yourself do the right thing and complete it. You feel good about yourself at the moment. And of course, the effect that it has on your future can be tremendous. Fortunately, self-discipline is a habit that you can learn with practice and repetition. If you do something over and over again, you eventually develop a habit. The difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is that successful people have success habits. And the most important success habit they have is the ability to make themselves do what they know they should do at this time. And wonderfully enough, if you practice it over and over again, it finally locks in. Now many people get into the habit of taking the easy way out, looking for shortcuts, and so on. So they actually get into a comfort zone of doing things that are harmful to their long-term future. And they actually feel uncomfortable completing tasks, or starting on their most important jobs. However, when you get into a new comfort zone, it will be easier for you to practice the habit of self-discipline than it would be in the past for you to take the shortcut. As the German philosopher said, everything is hard before it's easy. Everything is hard before it's easy. So developing the habit of self-discipline is hard. And be patient with yourself because you'll slip back all the time. All your life, you'll be slipping back. All your life, you have to fight this battle. You never get it to the point where it's locked in forever. Every morning you get up, and that alarm goes off, and you say, Do I sleep a little longer, or do I get up? You know, 
Every time you look at a list of things to do, you say, do I start with the most important thing? As they say, do the worst first, or do I do something that's fun and talk to a friend or make a phone call? You've got to fight this battle every single day. But every time you fight it, you feel better about yourself. It only takes about 21 days, they say, to develop a new habit. So you can lock in the foundation of the habit simply by practicing self-discipline every single day, without exception for 21 days. Some years ago, a businessman named Herbert Gray did a long-time study. It was kind of his project to find out what he called the common denominator of success. What would be the common denominator of success? And he spent 11 years studying the literature, interviewing people, reflecting on it, and he finally wrote a little pamphlet. And the pamphlet has been handed around for years and years. And you don't need to get it because I'll tell you what he said. The common denominator of success was quite simple. He said successful people he found make a habit of doing what unsuccessful people don't like to do. And of course the logical question is, well, what is it that unsuccessful people don't like to do? Well it turned out to be the same thing that successful people don't like to do either. But they do it anyway because they recognize that that's the price of success. For simple things like exercising, going for a run or a walk at the end of the day, well, do people like to do this? Do we look forward to exertion and perspiration and sweating and strain and everything else? No, we don't look forward to it. But we do it because we recognize that this is the price of looking and feeling fit, trim, living a long life, taking good care of our bodies, and so on. So remember, the same things that unsuccessful people don't like to do, are things you don't like to do either. Many years ago, I met Rich DeVos personally. You know, Rich DeVos is the founder of Amway, started off selling soap from door to door, and now he's worth about $5.3 billion, according to Forbes. And he was asked a question. He said, well, you know, how do you get over the fact that it's hard to prospect? It's hard to recruit. It's hard to build a business. It's hard to come home after work and work on building your business. He said, you just have to understand this. There's lots of things in life that you don't like to do, and you'll never like to do them. There's lots of hard things that contain stress, and they contain rejection, and potential failure, and hard work, and so on. He said, but you do them because you want to do the other things. It is only by doing the things that you don't want to do, that you can finally create the opportunity to do all the things that you want to do for yourself and your family. And again, it comes back to our favorite word, sacrifice. Being willing to pay the price in the present to enjoy the great rewards in the future. Now there are nine disciplines that you can develop that we'll talk about today. Disciplines that will improve every area of your life. And here's a rule. Every exercise of discipline in any area strengthens disciplines in every other area. Just as if you work out with your full body, that strengthens all your muscles, your heart, your lungs, and so on. Every weakness and discipline also weakens your other disciplines as well. So every time you exert yourself to discipline yourself, to make yourself do something, to control and master your natural tendency to seek the line of least resistance. Every time you master that tendency, you feel stronger and better, and you strengthen your ability to discipline yourself in other areas as well. So the first discipline of all is the discipline of clear thinking versus fuzzy thinking. You know sometimes you've heard me ask, what is the highest paid work in America? What's the most important work in any job or any company? And the answer is thinking. And you know the old saying, that some people think, some people think they think, and the great majority would rather die than think. But the discipline of clear thinking is the most important, because the way you think, the quality of your thinking, determines the quality of your decisions and choices. Your decisions and choices determine the actions you take. The actions you take determine your results. And your results determine the quality of your life. And it all starts with your thinking clearly. Thomas Edison once said that thinking is the hardest discipline of all. It requires real effort to think, because especially today, we are so surrounded with distractions. I'm always amazed when I go down the street or fly or drive, as people seem totally immersed in listening to things. They've got devices in their ears and stuff on their cell phone. They're listening to music in their car and they're watching television. They simply cannot stop bombarding their mind with sensory input. And of course, when you're doing that, it is impossible for you to think. To think well requires that you practice a couple of techniques. Now first of all, as Peter Drucker said, you need to take time to think. You need to create long, unbroken chunks of time. 
The rule is that fast decisions are usually wrong decisions, especially fast decisions involving people or money. So if you're going to make a decision that has long-term consequences, then you have to give it a lot of thought. You have to sort of look at it like a beautiful piece of porcelain. You look at it from every single side and think about it carefully. And the more carefully you think about a decision, the better the quality of that decision will be when you finally make it. How many times have you said, you know, if I just thought about that a little bit more, I wouldn't have done it. Or, if I just thought a bit better or I just taken time to think. Well, superior people, through experience and through painful experience, learn to take their time in making important decisions. So one of the very best ways that you can develop the discipline of clear thinking is to sit in solitude for 30 to 60 minutes when you have a major problem or major issue in your life. Solitude has been discovered and rediscovered throughout all the history of man as the most powerful of all thinking tools. You see, if you could imagine a bucket of water with silt in it and it's all churned up and you can't see anything, but if you leave the bucket of water to sit for a while, all the silt will drop to the bottom and the water will become perfectly clear. This is what happens for you in solitude. You sit calmly by yourself with no noise, no distractions, nothing to read, just sit quietly, which takes tremendous discipline the first few times you do it. At about 20 or 26 minutes, your mind goes clear, and any problem that you've been working on, the solution just pops into your mind. Any issue you've been dealing with, the answer just comes to you. It's almost like a miracle. When you practice solitude, you actually activate your superconscious mind and your intuition then something that you've been having trouble with or wrestling with suddenly becomes clear, and you know exactly what to do. Now here's the wonderful thing about solitude. Everybody who practices it will tell you it's incredible. And if you've never done it before, just practice it once sometime today. Take 25-30 minutes, take an hour if you can, and just sit quietly by yourself and allow your mind to calm. Sometimes it's called mind calming, and just allow yourself to calm down and think, and the most amazing things will happen. You'll start to make better decisions. You'll start to hear what is called the still small voice within. And this small voice or sometimes it will shout at you so loudly you will be amazed. Now here's another way to think better. When you're dealing with any kind of a situation, write down every detail of the problem or situation. Take a sheet of paper. And the rule is, think on paper. Think on paper and write down every detail. How it happened, what's going on, the problems, the concerns, the cost. Who's involved? Just write it down, write it down, write it down. And the most amazing thing happens between the head and the hand as you're writing out all the details. Sometimes exactly the right choice pops out at you. It becomes clear. But you would not have triggered that superconscious solution if you hadn't taken the time to think on paper. You know, Aristotle once said that wisdom, which is the greatest of all human desires, wisdom is the ability to make good decisions, is a combination of experience plus reflection. Experience plus reflection. In other words, you have an experience, and then you reflect on the experience and you think about what that experience means to me. How can I use that? What can I learn from it? So, reflecting on your experiences, the best way to do that is to go for a walk. Just going for a walk where you can't listen to anything, don't take an iPod or anything, just go for a walk, 30 or 60 minutes, and just walk, and while you're walking, Reflect upon something that's going on at work or at home. You'll be amazed at the quality of ideas that will come into your mind to improve your thinking. Talk it over with someone else who you like and trust and give them the details and ask them to give you their feedback, give you their perspective. Sometimes, if you're in a great relationship, the other person can give you a perspective that completely changes your ideas. A good way to think better is to ask, especially if you're frustrated or having difficulties, to ask. What are my assumptions? What am I assuming about the situation that may not be correct? What if my basic assumptions about this relationship, about this job, about this product or service or this investment were wrong? Then what would I do? And here's the key to good thinking. Be open to doing something completely different. Be open to admitting the possibility that you could be wrong and doing something completely different. And what that does is it opens up your mind and your perspective so you can see all kinds of possibilities that you may not have seen before. So clear thinking is the first discipline. It is the discipline practiced by the most successful, happiest, and wealthiest people in our society. Now the second major discipline, my old friend, is the discipline of daily goal setting. The discipline of daily goal setting will change your life. Why? 
because what we know is that focus and concentration are essential to success. There are some skills that are helpful to success, but focus and concentration are indispensable. If you cannot focus and you cannot concentrate, then you have to work for someone else who will make you focus and concentrate. They will supervise you. The ability to focus, to be clear about what you want, and then to concentrate single-mindedly on achieving it, are both habits or disciplines that you can learn through practice. So, you start off with the discipline of daily goal setting. You start off and you ask this question. This is the big question. What do I really want to do with my life? Why am I here? If I could do anything at all, what would I want to do with my life? And there's a great question that you can use to clarify this. Most people think in a very fuzzy way about what they want to do with their life because they're preoccupied with all of their problems in life. So, what you do is you remove all your problems by asking yourself this question. Imagine that I receive $10 million cash today, tax-free, in the bank. But at the same time I got a diagnosis from the doctor that said that you're going to die in 10 years. You'll have superb physical health for 10 years, but you're going to die in 10 years. So, if you had $10 million in the bank, which means you had no financial worries, and you had 10 years to live, what would you really want to do with your life? What would you do more of or less of? What would you start up, or what would you stop completely? What would you get into, or get out of? If you had 10 million in 10 years to live, imagine that for the moment. Because most people, again, as I said, become preoccupied with their limitations, with what they don't have, and it holds them back from deciding what they really, really want. Now the next thing you do is take a spiral notebook. And I carry a spiral notebook around with me all the time. Take a spiral notebook and write down 10 goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next 12 months or so. Write your goals in the present tense as though they already existed. Don't say, I will earn X number of dollars in the next 12 months. Write them down as though you are already earning it. Say, I earn X number of dollars this year. I always write the words by at the end of every goal. I will earn X number of dollars by December 31st, 2021. I achieve this goal by June 30th, 2022, and so on. When you give your subconscious mind a deadline, it works on it 24 hours a day. When you write down a goal, make sure it's positive. Don't say, I will quit smoking. Say, I am a non-smoker. Don't say, I will lose weight by weighing X number of pounds. And when you give your subconscious mind a command in the present tense that is contrary to your current situation, your subconscious mind goes to work to resolve this dynamic tension and make your external reality consistent with your new orders, your new commands, just your new goals. And finally, always write your goals in the personal tense. Use the word I, because only you, in the whole universe can use the word I relative to yourself. You say, I earn, I drive, I achieve, I acquire, I accumulate, I live in. In other words, always follow the word I, plus an action verb. Then you take a spiral notebook, and you write down at least 10 goals you can work on, 10 to 15 goals at a time, but never less than 10. Your subconscious and superconscious minds have incredible power, so give them lots of stuff to work on. And then what you do is every single day, you write down and rewrite your goals. Every single day, you take out your spiral notebook, and write down your goals once more. And I do this every morning before I start off. I plan my day, and then I write out my 10 goals every morning. Before you start out, you reprogram your subconscious mind, and then start your day. I promise to you this. If you will do this for one month, actually 21 days is good enough, your whole life will change. You'll see changes that are astonishing. People come up to me at every single seminar and say, it was incredible. I started to write my goals every day. I accomplished eight of them in six months, five in a week, most of them within 12 months. It's transformed my life. So. All I ask you to do if you're not already doing it, is to give it a try. Now the third discipline is the discipline of daily time management. And of course we know that the rule is that every minute spent in planning saves 10 minutes in execution. So disciplining yourself to plan your days thoroughly before you begin, will save you at least 10 minutes for every minute you spend in planning. And according to the research, it will increase your productivity by 25 to 50 percent, maybe even double your productivity. For every day that you plan, you see, if you're not working from a plan, then you just respond and react to whatever is going on. Somebody comes in, phone rings, it's an interruption or a problem, and you're off and running. But if you have a plan, you just keep working on the plan, it gives you a track to run on. 
So, begin the discipline of daily time management by making a list. Start off with a sheet of paper again. Think on paper and write down everything you have to do in the course of the day. The very best time to make this list is the night before. If you do this, then your subconscious mind works on your plan all night long, and you often wake up in the morning with great ideas to implement your plan. Then, you organize your list by priority before you begin. You don't just jump into it. Use the 80-20 rule that says that 20% of the items on your list will account for 80% of the value, which are the most valuable. This is the hardest of all disciplines to learn. It's the essence of my teaching worldwide. It is the key to supercharging the quality of your life and your results. If you can start every morning with a list organized by priority, and start on your number one task, and stay with it till it's done, you will supercharge your life. You will release endorphins in your brain that cause you to agree. You will motivate yourself and energize yourself and propel yourself into all your other tasks. You'll get twice as much done on any day where you start and complete your major task first, than any other day. The discipline of time management will then spread to all your other disciplines, when you can demonstrate each morning that you have the self-control, self-mastery, and self-discipline to start and complete your most important tasks. You just feel fabulous about yourself. Now the fourth discipline is the discipline of courage. And it goes back to what we said earlier. Force yourself to do what you know you should do, especially in the area of courage. The biggest obstacle to success, in my estimation, the estimation of psychologists, is the fear of failure. It's the fear that it won't work out. It's the fear of loss of time or money or emotion. It's fear that goes back to early childhood. And the only way we can succeed is by overcoming this fear. And this fear is captured in the words, I can't. I can't. What about this? What about that? What about this? Fully 80% of the population is paralyzed by the fear of making a mistake. And why? Because in growing up, you make lots of mistakes and don't like the feel of it. So, eventually you become conditioned to avoid taking any risk at all, so you have to overcome this in order to realize your potential. But what we know is that courage, the courage to face fears, is a habit, and its development is a practice just like typing with a typewriter or riding a bicycle. You can actually develop the habit of courage by practicing courage whenever it's required. Aristotle wrote about this in his Nicomachean Ethics in 350 BC. He said, If you desire to have a quality that you don't have, Act in every instance where the quality is called for, as though you already had it, and you will have it. So, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do the thing you fear, and the death of fear is certain. What he said was to confront your fears. The natural human tendency is to avoid a fear-causing or fear-inducing situation. Most of our fear problems seem to be bundled up with other people. By the way, it's confronting a boss. It's confronting a bad relationship. Sometimes it's confronting a prospect cold calling, going out and calling on customers, and facing rejection, failure, and embarrassment, and so on. But confronting that fear instead of avoiding it, just do it. So, the reason you want to confront your fears is not because of the incident specifically, it's because of what it does for your character. You want to demonstrate to yourself that you can face down a fear, look it square in the eye, and suddenly, surprise, surprise, it goes away. And you realize that the fear was in your own mind. Now, here's the most wonderful thing about overcoming fears. If the fear of failure is summarized with the feeling, I can't, psychologists have found you can actually short-circuit or override the fear by saying to yourself very strongly, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, and do it, and do it. If you're afraid of anything, talking to somebody, confronting someone, dealing with something, say to yourself over and over again, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, and then just do it. And you'll be amazed. The fear disappears, almost like poof, it's gone. So, the key is, you're looking at that telephone to pick up the phone to cold call to prospect. Just say to yourself, I could do it, I could do it, I can do it, and pick it up and dial, and suddenly, the fear disappears. And you do this repeatedly, and eventually, you develop the habit of courage. Here's an exercise for you. Identify one fear situation in your life today, and use that as your challenge. Use that as your test case. You say, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to face this fear down. I'm going to hammer it. I'm going to smash it. I'm going to look at it directly, head on, like a car hitting a wall, until the fear is gone. And once you've done that, you'll look up, and you'll be a different person for the rest of your life. 
you'll know that nothing that you're afraid of can stop you. The fifth discipline is the discipline of excellent health habits. Your goal should be to live to be 100 in sound physical health. Today, the average lifespan in America is approaching 80, which means 50% of people will die above that, and 50% of people will die below. Since you are smarter than the average or more knowledgeable, you're better informed. You're probably going to smash that average and live to be 90, 95, 100 years old. So, set 100 as your goal and say to yourself, Okay, I want to live to be 100 in great shape. What would I have to do? What kind of shape would I have to be? And what kind of life would I have to live physically in order to get there? First of all, design your ideal body. If your ideal body was perfect, in other words, weight, fitness, tone, stretch, flexibility, and everything. If your body was perfect, what would it look like? And make a list of all the things. Remember, when you were a child, your body was perfect. And if your body is not perfect now, it just means that maybe you've forgotten to do a few things, or you've done a few things you shouldn't have done. So, start off with a clear picture of your perfect body, and recognize that that is possible. Now the key to physical health has always been contained in the five-word formula. Eat less and exercise more. Eat less and exercise more. Every single person who studies the subject, and now more and more people realize that the key to success is to eat less, and exercise more, and exercise every day. So, discipline yourself to exercise daily. The very best time, of course, is in the morning. If you get up in the morning and exercise immediately, even if it's just stretching or going for a walk or riding a life cycle or walking on a treadmill, doesn't matter what it is. If you get up in the morning and exercise immediately, not only will your body continue to burn calories all day, not only will you be more alert because you'll have highly oxygenated blood flooding your brain first thing in the morning, but you'll develop the discipline of starting on something that you would normally not want to do and getting it done, getting it out of the way. The more times I read about wealthy people, successful people, and top business people, it's amazing how many of them get up at five and work out for an hour. It's absolutely astonishing. Over and over again, you see their daily routine, as they get up at five or 5.30, and they work out for an hour before they start planning and organizing their day. If you can discipline yourself to do that, it'll have an enormous impact on your life. Also, when you exercise first thing in the morning for 30 to 60 minutes, your brain releases endorphins which, as I said, make you happy. They make you feel exhilarated make you feel more creative, more positive. You'll feel more personable, you're more eager to get to work and so on. So, morning exercise just starts you off in fantastic mental and physical condition. Now to get rid of any extra weight that you might have, just eliminate the three white poisons. The three white poisons are anything that has flour in it. Flour, wheat flour, any kind of flour makes you overweight. It sticks to your gut, to your hips, and to your thighs. Eliminate sugar and any sugar, eliminate desserts, eliminate donuts, eliminate soft drinks. Don't eat things with sugar, and eliminate salt. Don't put any salt on your food, there's plenty of salt in everything you do. I ran into a friend of mine recently who lost 20 pounds. I looked at him, he was just swaying. I mean, his suit jacket was swaying back and forth like a tent on a tent peg in the wind. I said, geez, I said you've lost a lot of weight. I said, how did you do it? He said, I tried everything, I exercised, he said, I walked, I tried everything. He said, I finally stopped eating anything white, I stopped eating flour food sugar and salt, I dropped 22 pounds in 60 days, I never came back. And I've had people tell me that all over the world. So if you can discipline yourself to only eat fruits, vegetables and proteins, no pasta, no bread, no rolls, no cakes, no desserts, no coke, no colas, and no salt. If you can just do that, you'll see yourself losing weight from the first day. Some people will lose three or four pounds in the first week that they stop adding salt to anything. And then of course drink lots of water. Drink eight glasses of water a day. And what that does, it washes all the impurities out of your system. Very simple process, eat more salads. And here's a real key. Eat before 6 p.m. at night. Eat light and eat before 6 p.m. Everything you eat after 6 p.m., you accumulate. Everything you eat before 6 p.m. burns up before you go to bed. Don't eat within 3 hours of going to bed. Eat a light or medium light dinner, salad with a little bit of protein, before 6 p.m. or at 6 p.m., and you'll be astonished the next morning, you'll be thinner. 
It's absolutely remarkable. Two more things, by the way, with regard to health. First of all, get regular medical and dental checkups. People often don't go to the dentist or the doctor until they need to. I find that it's a false economy. Especially if you're over 40, you should have a complete medical every single year, and you should have regular dental checkups at least twice a year. If you're in business of any kind, you should have four visits to the orthodontist to clean your teeth every single year so that your teeth are really clean. They found there's a direct relationship between gum health and the health of your whole body. So, with regard to self-discipline, just remember the Michael Jordan motto, just do it. If you think it's a good idea, do it. Get on with it. Don't waste time. Don't make excuses. Now the sixth discipline is the discipline of regular saving and investing. One of the greatest goals that we have in life is to be financially independent. One of the greatest worries we have in life are our bills and our debts. The greatest fear we have in life is poverty or ending up with no money. So the very act of starting to provide for yourself financially transforms your thinking about yourself and your life. It makes you a happier person. So, that a goal of financial independence. Decide that, by gum, I'm going to become financially independent and resolve to get out of debt and stay out of debt. I've worked with countless people who have become financially independent starting from nothing. And one of the things they had was an aversion to debt. They hated debt. They avoided debt like the plague. The only debt they would accept maybe was debt on a mortgage on the house that they live in. Maybe debt on a car. But even then, they didn't like debt. Other than that, they avoided debt like the plague. So, to get out of debt and stay out of debt, you have to discipline yourself. Now, here's an interesting point. And I learned this from one of the smartest money managers I ever met. He said, when we're young, we associate money with pleasure. We get our first allowance, and we go and we spend it on candy. And we think that when we have money, we go and we spend it on candy or things that make us feel good. Now when we become adults, whenever we think of getting a lot of money, our first thought is spending it on something that makes us happy. If you go to a tourist resort where people are on vacation and having a good time, there are just lines of knickknacks and gadgets and junk because people, when they're happy, associate going out and buying stuff. However, what this does is it keeps you broke all your life. So, what you do, this is what he told me, is you rewire yourself. You kind of pull out one wire and replug it in, and you say, Instead of saying I like spending money, you say I like saving money. And you begin to think of how much you enjoy having money in the bank, how much you enjoy saving, how much you enjoy delayed gratification, how much you enjoy the idea of moving toward financial independence. And when you develop the habit of being happy about saving money, you start to find yourself more and more careful with your expenditures. Now you know the rule for financial independence is to save 10, 15, 20% of your income throughout your life. And as your income grows, Keep saving more and more and investing it, putting it away. As Albert Einstein said, compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. So, putting your money away in well-chosen mutual funds, money market funds, index funds, just letting it grow over time. And don't worry about the stock market going up and down. The average increase in the U.S. stock market for the last 100 years has been 8 to 10% each year, taking good years and bad years into consideration. So, your job is to save 10, 15, 20% of your income. Now for most people, because they're in debt, they just discard that completely. Their mind shuts down. So, here's what I say. Develop the habit of saving 1% of your income. If you make $2,000 a month, that means you save $20. You go down to the bank and you open up a financial freedom account, and you put in $20 from the first paycheck you get that month. And then you discipline yourself to live on the other 99%. Once you're comfortable living on 99%, then you increase it to 2%, and 3%, and 4%. Within a year, you'll have developed the habit of living on 85 to 90% of your income, and automatically saving the balance. You can even have the amount deducted from your paycheck so it disappears and you never see it. Your paycheck goes into the bank, and the amount is automatically deducted into your savings account, or into an investment account. Soon, you develop the habit of living on less than you earn, and you've changed your thinking from, I enjoy spending, to I enjoy saving. A key way to save your money is to delay and to defer major purchase decisions. You'll find that if you think about buying a car or a washing machine or a stereo set or a new computer, if you think about it for 30 days, in many cases, you won't do it at all. Or if you do, you'll make a better decision. 
One of the smartest things of all is to buy things that are used rather than things that are new. You know that millionaires never buy new cars. Millionaires never buy new cars. According to the studies by Stanley and Dano in The Millionaire Next Door, if they wait and they buy a car that's two years old, it's coming off lease or that's been driven for two years and somebody's trading it in, and it's still under warranty for three years. And you can even get extended warranties on many cars where they'll go back and clean it all up and give you another five years on a two-year-old car. But what have you done? You save ten or twenty thousand dollars on a car. And what do you do with that money? You put it away and let it grow with compound interest. If all you did was buy a used car every five to eight years, drive it until it falls apart, and then buy another one, the money saved from buying new cars can make you rich. It can accumulate with compound interest into hundreds of thousands of dollars by the end of your working lifetime. If you're going to invest, the rule is to investigate before you invest. My friend Ken Pfizer of Pfizer Investment says that two-thirds of all investing is avoiding making mistakes. Let me repeat that. Two-thirds of all success in investing or business is avoiding making mistakes, either by making the wrong decisions or by making decisions too quickly. So, if you're going to invest in anything, the rule is to spend as much time investigating the investment as you spent making the money. You'll find that quick investment decisions are invariably poor investment decisions. Invest only in things that you know and understand. Don't invest in somebody else's idea, scheme, or business. Only invest in things that you know. The number one rule is don't lose money. Whatever you do, don't lose money. If there's a possibility of losing a little bit of money and you do it, you're probably going to lose a lot. So, be very careful. Once you earn the money, hold on to it. There's a Japanese proverb that says, making money is like digging in the sand with a pin. Losing money is like pouring water on the sand. It's easy to lose money, but it's hard to make it and keep it. And it's the most important discipline of all. Another discipline is to pay cash as often as possible, and for as much as possible. Get rid of all your credit cards except for one, and only use that one when you have to. The very act of paying cash hypersensitizes you to how much it's costing, and causes you to spend less money. W. Clement Stone once said, If you cannot save money, the seeds of greatness are not in you. The primary reason why you save your money and accumulate it carefully, is because it gives you two things. First of all, it gives you freedom. You know you've got money in the bank. If you don't like your job, you can walk away from it because you've got money in the bank. But the second thing it gives you is opportunity. If an opportunity comes along, you're prepared to take advantage of it. You don't have to say, I'm sorry, I don't have any money, I can't afford it, I'm broke. And people just shake their head in pity and walk away. As an adult, you should always have opportunity money put aside. And when you have it, you feel great about yourself. The difference between a person with a little money and a person with no money is night and day. A person with a little money feels great. A person with no money always feels inferior, anxious, worried, concerned, irritable, short-tempered. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now the seventh discipline is the discipline of hard work. There's nothing that will help you more than for you to develop a reputation as a hard worker. In the studies of self-made millionaires they said, I didn't have better education, better talent, better knowledge, but I was willing to work harder than anyone else. Most self-made millionaires work 60 and 70 hours per week for 5, 10, 15 years before they break through. Most other people are trying to get by on 5 days a week, and then during those 5 days a week, they don't work very hard at all. The interesting thing, Thomas Jefferson once said, Do you believe in luck? He was asked. He said, Yes. He said, I believe in luck. He said, and the harder I work, the more that I have. So the harder you work, the luckier you get. The harder you work, the more opportunities you have, the more doors open up to you, the more opportunities you see. So, in America, the average work week is 32 hours, as you know. In France, legally, the average work week is 35 hours, but then most people waste about half their time at work. According to Robert Half International, the average person wastes 50% of their time in idle chit-chat with co-workers, coffee breaks, lunches, reading the paper, surfing the internet, doing all kinds of things that don't contribute anything to the work. Here's the rule that will make you successful, happy, and rich. Work all of the time. Work when you go to work, put your head down, and go to work. Don't waste a single minute. Put your head down, and work all day long. If somebody comes up to you and says, Hi, how are you doing? You say, fine. 
But right now, I've got to get back to work, back to work, back to work. If you've got a minute to chat, yes, but not now. Let's talk after work. Right now, I've got to get my job done, and nobody will ever stop you when you say, I've got to get back to work, I've got a job, I've got to get out, I've got something I have to get done. They'll go away and ruin someone else's career. Remember, the greatest time wasters in the world of work are other people who take up your time with idle chit chat and worthless gossip. You've got to avoid the time wasters in every single company. These people go around and they're like a virus. They go around and they infect everybody they talk to. Stay away from time wasters. Now here's a way to double your productivity, performance, output, and income. Here's a way to put yourself on the fast track, increase your income, and become one of the most valuable people in your industry. Start one hour earlier, and when you start, get to work. If the starting time in your company is at 8.30, start at 7, calm. Now you say, where are you going to get the time? Get up a little earlier and get going. Remember, all you do is beat the traffic. If you get in there early and get in there, plan your day, get going, get organized, get started. When other people come in, you are already running, you're already on your way. Work through lunch. There's no law that says you have to go out and kill an hour, an hour and a half at lunch. Eat at your desk, eat quickly, eat on the go, use that time to work. Don't use that time to hang around. There's a thing sweeping America today about having fun at work. No, work is not fun time. Work is not the playpen or the sandbox. Work is not school. Work is work. What you do is you go to work and you work all the time. Don't worry about fun. Have your fun later, knowing that you've done a fantastic job and you've gotten a lot done. And finally, work one hour later. Be the last one to leave. Be the person who turns off the lights. Interestingly, if you look at an entrepreneurial startup, a business that's being run by somebody who's really driving it forward, you'll find that business owners usually are the first ones there, work through the whole day, usually the last ones to leave. Business owners usually work on Saturday and Sunday. At the end of the day, the business owners got a beautiful home, a house on the hill, beautiful cars, a beautiful life, vacations, a boat, a yacht, and everybody says, boy, she sure is lucky. No, they're not lucky. They just worked all the time. They work. If you work three extra hours, start earlier, work harder, day later, you'll add six hours of productive work to your day. Every hour of uninterrupted work when nobody's there translates into three hours of productivity when there's people around interrupting you. So, keep asking at work, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? And then do only that. And keep saying, back to work, back to work. Whenever you get distracted, or you start to follow the path of least resistance. I major in my mind or say, wait a minute, I've got to get back to work, back to work, back to work. Now the eighth discipline is the discipline of continuous learning. The rule is to earn more, you must learn more. If you want to earn more than you're earning today, you've got to learn new knowledge and skills that make it possible. Jim Rowan once famously said, work at least as hard on yourself as you do on your work. So, how do you do this? Well, you read in your field daily. If you reach 60 minutes a day in your field, a little in the morning, a little in the evening, it'll translate into one book a week. One book a week will translate into 50 books a year. The average adult reads less than one book a year, and most non-fiction books are never read past the first chapter. If you read 50 books a year, it's the equivalent of getting a PhD in your field every single year. Just reading every day will make you one of the most proficient, most skilled, and ultimately highest paid people in your field. Listen to CDs in your car, like this. The average person drives 500 to 1000 hours a year. That's the equivalent of 3 to 6 months of a 40 hour week. That's the equivalent of 1 to 2 full time university semesters. But listening to educational CDs in your car will make you one of the best informed people in your field. And finally, in continuous learning, attend seminars, take courses, take structured courses given by experts given by authorities. You can learn more in a half day or a day from an expert than you might learn on your own in years. I've had many people walk out of my courses with one new idea and increase their income five times within 30 days. One new technique for getting new clients, prospecting, one new technique for presenting or overcoming objections, one new technique for closing sales or getting referrals, and their income exploded. They'd have never learned it. They call me, they come to me, they say it was incredible, it changed my life, that one idea. 
Now the average income in America increases about 3% a year. But with additional knowledge and skill, you increase the rate at which your income goes up. If you get new knowledge and skill, you learn more, your income goes up 10% per annum, you'll double your income in 7.2 years. If your income goes up 25% per year, you'll double your income in 2 years and 8 months. In other words, the more you learn, the more you earn. The benefits of continuous learning are life-changing. And here's the final one, the ninth discipline, the discipline of persistence. Now the discipline of persistence says that the greatest test of self-discipline is when you persist in the face of adversity and you drive yourself forward to complete your tasks 100%. The test of self-discipline is when you can drive yourself to keep on keeping on, even when everyone around you feels like quitting, and you feel like quitting as well. We say that courage has two parts. The first part of courage is the courage to begin. It's the courage to start. It's the courage to launch in the face of failure, with no guarantees of success. But the second part of courage is the courage to endure. It's the courage to persist and to keep on going when you're tired and you're disappointed and nothing's working, and there's no guarantee of success, and maybe even a very large likelihood of failure. So, it's really important. We say that your persistence is your measure of your belief in yourself and what you are doing. If you truly believe in the goodness and rightness and value of what you're doing, you will persist regardless of what's happening on the outside. And the more you believe in the goodness and rightness of what you're doing, the more you will persist, and wonderfully enough. The more you persist, the more you believe in yourself, and the more you believe in the value of your work. Persistence seems to change your character. In reality, persistence is self-discipline in action. In the final analysis, your persistence is your measure of self-discipline. Self-discipline leads to self-esteem. Every time you practice self-discipline, you feel better about yourself, which leads to greater persistence, which leads to even greater self-discipline. You get onto an upward spiral in life. That's why Napoleon Hill said that persistence is to the character of a man or woman, as carbon is to steel. You actually make yourself. You shape yourself. You form yourself. You build yourself into a superior human being, a better and stronger person, by persisting when you feel like quitting. Well, every time you have the tendency to quit, every time you feel like giving up or cutting corners or stopping before you finish your task, say, wait a minute, this is a test. This is a test of my character. This is the test to see what I'm made of. And it's not what I'm working on that counts. It's the person I am becoming by either persisting or quitting. So, always persist until you have completed the task. And as you do, you burst through, and your brain is flooded with endorphins, and you feel wonderful about yourself. Eventually, you develop that habit of persistence, and you become unstoppable. Here are the seven benefits of practicing self-discipline in every area of your life. The habit of self-discipline guarantees your success. Every single successful person has that fundamental quality of persistence and tenacity, that fundamental quality of self-discipline, to make themselves do what they should do whether they feel like it or not. When you practice self-discipline, you'll get more done faster and better than other people. You'll get more results. You'll be more productive. You'll have higher levels of performance. You'll bring yourself to the attention of people who can help you, support you, and move you forward. You'll be paid more and promoted faster at any job, in any situation. The people with high levels of self-discipline who get results are the ones who are immediately moved to the front of the line of life. You'll have a greater sense of self-control, self-reliance, and personal power. You'll feel that you could do anything that you put your mind to, because you have the ability to make yourself, to discipline yourself, to do it anyway. Self-discipline is the key to self-esteem, self-respect, and personal pride. Every time you discipline yourself, you'll like yourself more. Every time you discipline yourself, you see yourself as a better person. Every time you discipline yourself, you feel great about yourself. You feel personally proud of yourself. It affects your personality in a very positive way. The greater your self-discipline, the greater your self-confidence, and the lower your fears of failure and rejection. Eventually, you develop self-confidence so that you'll walk through walls. With self-discipline, you'll have the strength of character to persist over all obstacles until you succeed. With self-discipline, you achieve personal greatness. Ladies and gentlemen, Today we embark on an exploration of a concept that is both simple and profound, capable of transforming not only your financial circumstances, but every facet of your existence. 
The Art of Thinking Like a Millionaire You may wonder, what exactly defines the mindset of a millionaire? Is it merely possessing a bank account with seven figures? Or is there a deeper, more accessible essence to it? Available to each of us right here, right now? Let's begin with a fundamental truth. Millionaires approach money, success, failure, goals, and life itself with a distinctive mindset, one cultivated through habits, attitudes, and actions aligned with their goals. Firstly, millionaires understand the power of setting clear, specific, and challenging goals as the cornerstone of their success. But I ask you, how many of you have goals that truly ignite your passion and drive your actions? Thinking like a millionaire begins with knowing precisely what you want to achieve. Now let's delve into the millionaire's attitude towards learning. Continuous learning is the bedrock upon which they build their empire. They are avid readers, keen listeners, and active participants in expanding their knowledge and skills. When was the last time you pushed yourself to learn something new, to step out of your comfort zone? Remember, the moment you cease learning is the moment you stagnate. Resilience is another critical aspect of the millionaire mindset. They face setbacks and failures like anyone else, but they refuse to let these define them. Instead, they view them as stepping stones, as invaluable learning opportunities that pave the path to success. Can you recall a time when you turned a failure into a lesson, a springboard toward your own triumph? Let's also consider the value millionaires place on time. They recognize it as the most precious commodity, one that, once spent, cannot be reclaimed. They prioritize, focus, and delegate. They understand that to truly think like a millionaire, you must master your time. How do you prioritize your tasks? Are you focusing on activities that move you closer to your goals? Millionaires think in terms of abundance, not scarcity. They see opportunities where others see obstacles. They believe in creating value and enriching the lives of others. This mindset of abundance opens doors, creates opportunities, and builds networks of success and support. Do you see the world through the lens of abundance or scarcity? Building on this exploration of the millionaire mindset, it's crucial to recognize that this way of thinking extends beyond mere financial acumen. It's a holistic approach to life itself. The essence of thinking like a millionaire involves a profound understanding of the interplay between mindset and tangible success, a synergy that propels individuals towards achieving their most ambitious dreams. Consider the concept of abundance, a principle that transcends the mere accumulation of wealth. This perspective is about seeing limitless possibilities in every situation, opportunity in every challenge, and potential in every individual. But how does one cultivate such a mindset? It begins with gratitude. By acknowledging and appreciating what you have, you open yourself to receiving more. It's a principle that seems counterintuitive, yet holds profound power. When you operate from a place of gratitude, you attract more reasons to be grateful, thereby expanding your capacity to give and receive. Now let's shift our focus to relationships, an area where millionaires often excel. They understand that success is not a solo journey, but a collaborative effort. Building strong, positive relationships is not just about networking. It's about connecting on a deeper level, offering value without the immediate expectation of receiving something in return. This approach to relationships, rooted in genuine interest and generosity, paves the way for long-term partnerships and opportunities that might not otherwise arise. Ask yourself, how can I add value to someone's life today? This simple yet profound question can transform your approach to interactions, opening doors to mutual growth and success. Furthermore, embracing risk is another facet of the millionaire mindset. While the idea of taking risks might evoke fear or uncertainty, millionaires view risk as an essential ingredient for growth. However, it's not about reckless gambles but calculated risks, decisions informed by research, intuition, and sometimes the courage to step into the unknown. Ask yourself, what's holding me back? Is it fear of failure, or perhaps the comfort of the familiar? Identifying and confronting these barriers is the first step towards embracing the risks that lead to significant rewards. Now consider the role of discipline and consistency. Millionaires don't rely on bursts of motivation, they cultivate discipline, a commitment to consistent action regardless of how they feel. This discipline applies to every aspect of their lives, from financial investments to personal development and health. It's about making the choice to do what's necessary even when it's not easy. Reflect on your daily habits. Do they align with your goals? 
Are you consistent in your efforts even when progress seems slow? Remember, consistency compounds over time, turning small actions into significant outcomes. Moreover, the concept of legacy is integral to the millionaire mindset. It's not just about wealth accumulation, but about the impact one leaves on the world. This could mean mentoring the next generation, contributing to meaningful causes, or building a business that solves real problems. Think about the legacy you want to create. How do you want to be remembered? By aligning your actions with your values, you can build a legacy that transcends material success, one that makes a lasting difference in the lives of others. In the pursuit of thinking like a millionaire, it's also vital to embrace innovation and adaptability. The world is constantly changing, and millionaires stay ahead by being flexible and open to new ideas. They're not afraid to pivot, to try new strategies, or to venture into uncharted territories. This adaptability is grounded in a mindset of lifelong learning and curiosity. Ask yourself, what new ideas can I explore today? How can I adapt to the changing landscape of my field? By fostering a mindset of innovation, you position yourself to thrive in an ever-evolving world. Continuing our exploration into the millionaire mindset, we find that this perspective extends into the realms of self-awareness and emotional intelligence. Millionaires understand themselves, their strengths, weaknesses, and triggers. This self-awareness allows them to navigate complex situations and relationships more effectively, making decisions that align with their deepest values and goals. They ask themselves reflective questions like, what drives me? And what are my core values? These inquiries are not just philosophical musings, but practical examinations that guide their choices and interactions. Emotional intelligence plays a pivotal role in this journey. It's the ability to recognize and manage your emotions, as well as understand and influence the emotions of others. Millionaires harness this skill to foster positive relationships, navigate negotiations, and lead teams to success. They practice empathy by actively listening to understand the needs and perspectives of those around them. This capacity for empathy not only enhances their business dealings, but enriches their personal relationships, creating a network of mutual respect and support. Moreover, a crucial aspect of the millionaire mindset is the focus on impact over income. While financial success is a significant goal, it's the desire to make a difference, to contribute to something larger than themselves that truly motivates millionaires. They seek to create value, solve problems, and improve lives through their ventures. This purpose-driven approach not only leads to wealth but to fulfillment and a sense of accomplishment. Reflect on your own aspirations beyond financial success. What impact do you wish to have? How can your talents and resources be used to make a positive difference in the world? Adaptability and innovation, as mentioned, are indispensable qualities. But let's delve deeper into these qualities. In an era marked by rapid technological advancement and shifting market dynamics, millionaires stay agile, constantly learning and evolving. They're not wedded to traditional methods but are always on the lookout for new ways to achieve their goals. This might mean adopting new technologies, exploring emerging markets, or even pivoting their entire business model in response. The key here is not just flexibility, but a proactive approach to change. They don't wait for change to happen. They anticipate it, prepare for it, and often are the catalyst for it. This forward-thinking mindset is complemented by a commitment to excellence. Millionaires don't settle for mediocrity. They strive for excellence in every endeavor, whether it's a product they're developing, a service they're offering, or the team they're building. This pursuit of excellence is driven by a deep belief in the value of their work and a desire to deliver the best possible outcomes. Consider your own standards. Are you pushing yourself to achieve your best, or are you settling for good enough? Furthermore, resilience, as previously discussed, is a hallmark of the millionaire mindset. But it's worth reiterating the importance of this quality. Millionaires view failures not as endpoints, but as essential steps on the path to success. They understand that setbacks are inevitable, and that true growth comes from overcoming these challenges. They embrace failure as a teacher, analyzing their mistakes, learning from them, and applying these lessons to future endeavors. This resilience is rooted in a deep-seated optimism, a belief that no matter the obstacles, success is possible with persistence and hard work. Lastly, let's talk about the balance millionaires strive to achieve in their lives. While dedicated to their goals and work, they also understand the importance of balance, taking time for family, health, hobbies, and personal growth. 
They know that a well-rounded life is not only more fulfilling, but also enhances their effectiveness in all areas. They practice self-care, prioritize their well-being, and make time for the people and activities that bring them joy. This balance isn't about dividing their time equally among different aspects of their lives, but about integrating these aspects in a way that complements and enriches their overall experience. In essence, thinking like a millionaire is about so much more than financial success. It's a comprehensive approach to life that encompasses self-awareness, emotional intelligence, impact, adaptability, innovation, excellence, resilience, and balance. As you continue on your journey, remember that each step you take in cultivating this mindset brings you closer to realizing your fullest potential. Not just as a financial achiever, but as a well-rounded, impactful human being. Embarking further into the nuances of the millionaire mindset, we arrive at a crossroads of introspection and action. This journey isn't merely about attaining wealth. It's about cultivating a life that's rich in experiences, relationships, and personal fulfillment. A critical aspect of this mindset is the relentless pursuit of self-improvement. Millionaires understand that they are their most valuable investment. They allocate time, resources, and energy into enhancing their physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Recognizing that a sharp mind, a healthy body, and a peaceful spirit are indispensable tools in the quest for success. Self-improvement for millionaires goes beyond traditional education and fitness routines. It involves a deep dive into personal values, beliefs, and behaviors, constantly questioning and refining them to align more closely with their ultimate goals. It's about becoming the best version of oneself, not just for personal gain, but to serve as a beacon for others to follow. They inspire not by words alone, but by the example they set through their actions and their approach to life's challenges and opportunities. This journey of self-improvement is also marked by a commitment to giving back. Millionaires know that true wealth comes not from what you have, but from what you give. Their success is not measured solely by the balance in their bank accounts, but by the impact they have on the lives of others. They invest in their communities, support causes close to their hearts, and use their resources to make a difference. This philanthropic approach is rooted in a belief in the interconnectedness of all things and the understanding that by helping others, we elevate ourselves. Another cornerstone of the millionaire mindset is strategic thinking. Millionaires approach their goals with a strategic mindset, always looking for the most effective and efficient path to success. They are masters of leverage, utilizing their time, resources, and networks in ways that amplify their efforts and results. Strategic thinking also involves anticipation, looking ahead, predicting changes, and preparing to capitalize. This forward-looking approach enables them to navigate the complexities of the business world and life with agility and foresight. Moreover, millionaires cultivate an environment that supports their growth and success. They surround themselves with people who inspire them, challenge them, and push them to achieve. This environment isn't limited to their immediate circle of friends and colleagues but extends to the books they read, the media they consume, and the spaces they inhabit. They understand that the environment shapes their mindset, influences their actions, and ultimately impacts their success. The concept of work-life harmony is also integral to the millionaire mindset. Unlike the traditional notion of work-life balance, which implies a strict segregation between professional and personal life, millionaires seek harmony. They integrate their work and personal life in a way that each enriches the other. This holistic approach acknowledges that fulfillment comes from the integration of all life's facets, work, family, and personal pursuits. In pursuing this harmony, millionaires also embrace mindfulness and presence. They understand the power of being fully present in each moment, whether in a boardroom meeting, at a family dinner, or during a solitary morning routine. This mindfulness enhances their decision-making, deepens their relationships, and enriches their life experiences. It allows them to live fully, making the most of each day and every opportunity that comes their way. Finally, the millionaire mindset is characterized by an unwavering belief in oneself and one's vision. Despite challenges, setbacks, or the skepticism of others, millionaires maintain a steadfast faith in their ability to achieve their dream. This belief isn't blind optimism, but a deep-seated confidence built on experience, knowledge, and the courage to take calculated risks. It's this belief that propels them forward, fueling their persistence and driving them toward their goals. In conclusion, 
The millionaire mindset transcends the accumulation of wealth. It's a comprehensive approach to life that encompasses self-improvement, giving back, strategic thinking, environmental optimization, work-life harmony, mindfulness, and self-belief. Cultivating this mindset requires effort, introspection, and a commitment to continual growth and contribution. It's about embracing life's journey with passion, purpose, and a relentless drive to achieve. Not just financial success, but a legacy of impact and inspiration. As you embark on this journey, remember that each step you take is a step toward becoming the architect of your destiny, crafting a life of abundance, fulfillment, and unparalleled success. At this juncture of our exploration into the millionaire mindset, it's imperative to delve deeper into the essence of adaptability and continuous evolution. Millionaires in their journey embody the principle of being fluid like water, adapting to the contours of their environment while maintaining their inherent force and direction. This adaptability isn't merely reactive but proactive. It involves constantly scanning the horizon for emerging trends, shifts in the marketplace, and changes in consumer behavior. They pivot not out of desperation, but from a place of strength and foresight, always staying a step ahead of the curve. In cultivating such adaptability, millionaires also embrace the concept of lifelong learning. But this learning is not confined to their field of expertise alone. They draw insights and inspiration from a wide array of disciplines, art, science, philosophy, history, understanding that innovation often occurs at the intersection of diverse fields. This broad spectrum of knowledge not only enriches their worldview, but also fuels their creativity, enabling them to approach problems with fresh perspectives and come up with groundbreaking solutions. Furthermore, millionaires understand the significance of resilience, rooted not just in enduring setbacks but in emerging from them stronger and more determined. This resilience is cultivated through a mindset that views failures as not just inevitable, but essential components of the journey to success. They dissect their failures, extracting valuable lessons, and applying them to future endeavors. This iterative process of action, reflection, learning, and adaptation forms the core of their approach. Moreover, the millionaire mindset emphasizes the importance of vision. Millionaires are visionaries, not just dreamers. They possess the ability to envision a future that others can't see, and the conviction to bring that vision to life. Their vision serves as a beacon, guiding their decisions, actions, and priorities. It's a vision that extends beyond personal gain, encompassing a broader impact on society, the economy, and the environment. They ask themselves, What legacy do I want to leave, and how can my success contribute to the greater good? This forward-looking perspective ensures that their work is imbued with purpose and meaning. Central to the millionaire mindset is also the mastery of emotional intelligence. Millionaires recognize that while intelligence is important, emotional intelligence is equally crucial. It enhances their leadership abilities, enabling them to inspire and motivate their teams, build strong relationships, and navigate the complexities of human dynamics in both business and personal life. They cultivate empathy, listening not just to respond but to truly understand, thereby forging deep connections that transcend mere transactions. In addition, millionaires prioritize their well-being. Understanding that physical, mental, and emotional health are foundational to success. They invest in their health by incorporating practices that nourish their bodies and minds, such as regular exercise, balanced nutrition, mindfulness, and meditation. This holistic approach to health ensures they have the energy, clarity, and stamina to pursue their goals with vigor and resilience. Equally important is the millionaire's approach to risk. They approach risk strategically, weighing potential rewards against possible losses, but they're not paralyzed by the fear of failure. Instead, they're motivated by the potential for learning and growth. They understand that taking calculated risks is essential for breakthroughs, and that every risk taken is an investment in their learning and development. Lastly, the millionaire mindset is characterized by gratitude and humility. Millionaires, despite their achievements, remain grounded, recognizing that their success is not solely the result of their efforts, but also the support of countless individuals along the way. They express gratitude regularly, not just as a courtesy, but as a core value that guides their interactions and decisions. This gratitude is coupled with humility, the understanding that no matter how much they achieve, there's always more to learn, more ways to grow, and more opportunities to give back. In summary, 
The millionaire mindset is a dynamic and multifaceted approach to life that encompasses adaptability, lifelong learning, resilience, vision, emotional intelligence, health and well-being, and risk-taking. It's a mindset that seeks not just financial success, but a rich, fulfilling life marked by continuous growth, meaningful contributions, and deep connection. As you journey toward cultivating this mindset, remember that each step, each decision, each risk, and each failure is part of the tapestry of your success story. Embrace the journey with openness, curiosity, and an unwavering commitment to your vision, and watch as the world unfolds in ways you never imagined, further into the essence of what it means to cultivate a millionaire mindset. It becomes evident that such a mindset isn't just about achieving personal success. It's about transforming that success into a catalyst for broader change. Millionaires understand that their achievements have the power to inspire, influence, and ignite change beyond their immediate circle. They see their journey not as a solitary climb to the top, but as a collective expedition where lifting others becomes an integral part of their own ascent. This notion of success is deeply intertwined with the concept of service. The true mark of a millionaire mindset is the seamless integration of success with service. Millionaires recognize that wealth is not the end goal, but a tool, a means to effect positive change, empower communities, and build a legacy that outlives their physical presence. They ask, how can my success serve as a bridge for others? This question guides their philanthropic efforts, their business practices, and their personal philosophy. They invest in education, innovation, and solutions to pressing global challenges, understanding that their contribution can spark a chain reaction of growth and development. Moreover, the journey toward embodying a millionaire mindset reveals the importance of authenticity and integrity. Millionaires know that long-term success is built on a foundation of trust, transparency, and ethical behavior. They lead by example, ensuring that their actions align with their words and values. This consistency between values and actions not only reinforces their credibility, but also establishes a strong foundation of trust with their employees, customers, and partners. In addition to integrity, the millionaire mindset is characterized by an unyielding commitment to excellence. Millionaires pursue excellence in all endeavors, refusing to settle for mediocrity. They understand that excellence is not a destination, but a continuous journey of improvement and refinement. This pursuit goes beyond their professional life, extending to their personal development, relationships, and contributions to society. They set high standards, challenge the status quo, and relentlessly push the boundaries of what's possible. Another critical aspect of the millionaire mindset is the cultivation of a positive attitude. Millionaires approach life with optimism and a can-do spirit. They view challenges as opportunities for growth and learning, and setbacks as temporary obstacles to be overcome. This positive attitude is infectious, creating an environment of motivation, innovation, and resilience. They inspire those around them to adopt a similar outlook, fostering a culture of positivity and possibility. Furthermore, millionaires are adept at navigating the complexities of human relationships. They excel in communication, negotiation, and conflict resolution, understanding that strong relationships are the bedrock of successful business. They listen actively, communicate clearly, and negotiate with empathy, always seeking win-win outcomes. They approach conflicts not as battles to be won, but as puzzles to be solved collaboratively. This skill in managing relationships not only enhances their ability to lead effectively, but also enriches their personal lives, fostering deep and meaningful connections with those around them. In cultivating a millionaire mindset, it's also essential to embrace vulnerability. Millionaires understand that vulnerability is not a weakness but a strength. It's the courage to be open about one's fears, failures, and uncertainties. This openness fosters authenticity, builds trust, and encourages others to share their own stories and struggles. It creates a space for genuine connection and learning. Embracing vulnerability allows millionaires to remain grounded and connected to their humanity, reminding them that success is not just about the accolades, but also about the journey with all its highs and lows. Lastly, the millionaire mindset embraces the power of gratitude. Millionaires practice gratitude not as an occasional gesture, but as a daily habit. They recognize and appreciate the people, opportunities, and experiences that have contributed to their success. This gratitude extends beyond mere acknowledgement. 
It's an active expression of thanks through their actions, decisions, and interactions. Practicing gratitude keeps them grounded, fosters a sense of contentment, and attracts more positivity into their lives. In sum, the millionaire mindset is a multifaceted paradigm that encompasses service, integrity, excellence, positivity, relationship mastery, vulnerability, and gratitude. It's a mindset that challenges conventional definitions of success, urging us to look beyond material wealth and consider the broader impact of our actions. As you continue to cultivate this mindset, remember that each choice, each interaction, and each challenge is an opportunity to embody these principles. By doing so, you not only accelerate your own journey toward success, but also inspire others to embark on their path of growth and contribution.